Can you guys hear me okay? Thumbs up? Okay, cool. Um, let's see. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you guys all for being here. My name is Audrey. Um, I'll give like a little more of an introduction to myself uh, if I don't know you here in a few minutes when I start the presentation. I'll give like a little um, but just more of a an couple of myself. housekeeping things. Uh, just as a reminder, you um, if you guys if you could stay muted unless you're asking a question um, or making comment or or whatever, um, I'll provide time. Probably like you know after I do my kind of spiel and then we'll have some time at the end for questions for both Eric or me or whoever. Um, but you're more than welcome to kind of pop your, your questions or comments or anything in the chat um, as we go. Um, if you are on Facebook Live, uh, thank you for being here also. And there is a bit of a lag for Facebook Live. Um, so if you are like speaking from Facebook Live or if you have a um, question or a comment on there, it just may be a little delayed for us just to kind of give you a heads up on that. Um, and then if you can't stay for the whole time um, for any reason, this will be recorded and we'll be putting it on our Facebook and probably on our YouTube as well. Or if you have like a friend or someone who couldn't make it, um, but who does want to see it. I know it's the middle of the day on a Friday, so not everyone is available at that time. Um, but it will be recorded um, to watch at a later time. So um, yeah, so today is the second of our kind of lunch and learn series that we're doing. We started last month going through May. We'll be doing it once a month um, toward the end of the month. Um, so today we'll be kind of transitioning from the biodiversity basics that we did last time, if you were here for that. Um, we kind of just did a general intro to biodiversity, why it's important. And today we're gonna be kind of transitioning and talking about some specific species. So I will be talking about mussels, kind of more generally about mussels. Like some people don't know a whole lot about mussels. So, um, and then I'll talk about a fish species. Um, and then I will be handing it over to Eric Teetsworth, who is a PhD candidate at um, NC State University. We met when I was there because I went there for grad school as well. I got my master's there in wildlife conservation biology and um, Eric and I met when I was there, but then we um, lay out, out at West Point um, when he, he was out there doing noose, noose river water dog uh, um, surveys. So anyway, I just thought it would be a really cool um thing if we could if we could bring him in and have him talk a little bit about his research because he is our he's a, a an expert in new server water dogs he's been working with them for several years now so um so yeah um i think that's about it uh i'll go ahead and start with my present oh i need to share my screen i almost forgot about that let's see okay can everybody see that the special okay perfect um great well i'm gonna go ahead oh okay, hillary will admit him i didn't just ignore that person if you saw that pop up um okay so um my name is audrey vaughn uh, i am actually an americorps uh, member serving at the Eater river association um, as an environmental educator so i've been here for about seven months now um and it's been amazing and I've loved it a lot. Uh, but my background is mostly in wildlife conservation biology, um, but I'm also just really interested in more general like human environment interactions and getting people kind of more interested and invested in um, protecting the natural world in whatever capacity they, uh, they would like to um, or are able to. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's about it. I'm just gonna give a little intro about the Eno. I just feel like, I don't know, laying the groundwork. I'm sure that most of you are familiar, but um, the Eno watershed is in the Upper Noose River Basin in Central North Carolina. The watershed covers about 151 square miles and it spans um, portions of both Durham and Orange counties, as I'm sure you all know. The Eno itself is just under 40 miles long um, and includes many important tributaries. Um, and yeah, freshwater systems like the Eno make up a really small percentage of the Earth's surface, um, like less than 3%, uh, but they support a really huge amount of biodiversity 
including obviously fish and amphibians and reptiles, macroinvertebrates, birds. They support mammals, all sorts of, of kind of flora, well, fauna, as well as flora um, that are supported by, by freshwater systems like the Eno. Um, now, the Eno has been found to generally have relatively good water quality depending on the exact location. Um, it supports a pretty robust, oops, pretty robust um, group of flora and fauna, which can be kind of seen on, on this slide. So um, at least 61 species of fish, 12 species of freshwater mussels, 14 species of snakes, seven species of turtles, 15 species of amphibians, over 100 species of trees. So um, it supports a pretty, a pretty diverse array of, of flora and fauna. Um, now, scientists have identified at least at least 14 rare animal species living in and along or supported by the Eno. Um, now, at the same time, a 2018 study found that there are occasional occurrences of elevated turbidity and fecal coliform bacteria, and then there's also evidence of eroded banks um, within the study area that they focused on, um, which is, you know, definitely something to be aware of. There are definitely um, things that we need to keep in mind with regards to how certain human practices could negatively impact the water quality of the Eno and in turn impact important species um, like the ones we're going to focus on today and also of course negatively impact us. So even though I say, you know, as I'm sure you're all aware saying that, oh, there's relatively good water quality within um, a given river that, that obviously there's still um, things going on in the area that can impact that over time. So um, certainly there needs to be continued research and continued awareness of things like land development and, um, you know, deforestation. So um, we're going to be spotlighting three species that have been found historically in the Eno, but some of these species either have really small or even extirpated populations within the Eno. Um, however, as we will see, the Eno still represents a critically important like habitat for these species and may be important um, in future conservation efforts for these species. So um, I am going to keep doing that. Go ahead and dive in with um, some cool organisms. So mussels. Um, mussels may not be something that people get super excited about or know a whole lot about, or maybe it is, you know, some people are probably into mussels, but obviously they're not that kind of like charismatic uh, megafauna that we hear about my, and that comes to mind when you think about and like wildlife conservation, but freshwater mussels are incredibly important. Very, very, very important. So um, mussels are bivalve mollusks. They can be found in both freshwater and saltwater ecosystems, but um, freshwater mussels live on river bottoms usually, and most are going to require that clean flowing water to survive and to reproduce. Um, Worldwide, there are about a thousand species of mussels, and about a third of those occur in the United States, with most being concentrated in the Southeast, which is pretty cool. Um, mussels play a really key role um, in aquatic ecosystems. So they're considered, one thing is that they're considered to be ecosystem engineers um, because they can modify aquatic ha habitat and make it more suitable for both themselves as well as for other organisms. Um, they play a really important role in cleaning water by filtering out bacteria, algae, phytoplankton, as well as some pollutants um, as they breathe and as they feed. So they actually use gills, they have gills um, to both breathe and to filter feed. Um, and then they're also important food source, uh, an important food source for animals like fish and crayfish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. There are different species that, um, that will consume mussels. Um, and their shells can provide shelter for insects and for plants, and then empty shells can also serve as nesting sites for fish, like darters, things like that. Um, another important thing and cool thing about mussels is that they're very heavily reliant on fish for their reproductive cycle. So female mussels produce eggs, which are kept in their gills, which is another, their gills are like multi purpose. Um, so they keep their eggs in the gills until they develop into larvae called glochidia. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, the glochidia are then expelled into the water where they have to attach to the gills of a host fish. And the glochidia will take nutrients from the fish 
and then transform into a juvenile muscle um, and then detach from the fish. So just keep that in mind because that's something we'll mention um, is that, you know, muscles need those other like fish, they need fish in order to complete their reproductive cycle. Um, now, unfortunately, freshwater mussels are also, according to the US Fish and Wildlife Service, they are the most endangered group of organisms in the US. Um, nearly 70% of mussels in the US have undergone population declines with some species experiencing declines of more than 90%. And this is mostly a result I can, it can have multiple effects, but it's mostly going to be a result of water pollution, um, you know, from runoff and sedimentation and, and all that kind of stuff um, from human use of, of lands. Um, and then also things like implementation of dams and even natural, even like beaver, beavers building dams um, can negatively impact um, mussels, freshwater mussels. But obviously the big dams that humans build um, are, are for various reasons that we will discuss are gonna have a negative impact on, on freshwater mussels at a pretty you know, large scale. So to talk about, or to move into the species that I um, chose to focus on, there are a few that I was kind of reading about. Um, uh, I chose to talk about the dwarf wedge mussel. Um, and this is an aquatic bivalve mollusk. Uh, it's in the family Union today. And I'm, once again, I'm not positive I'm saying that right, but those are the river mussels. Um, and the dwarf wedge mussel is typically going to inhabit uh, small to medium sized streams with moderate flow and stable sand, gravel and cobble substrates. Um, now I read a little bit about, there have been some studies done on like what kinds of fish species, if anyone is just curious, what kind of fish species are effective hosts? Cause it's not like, oh, any old fish can be an effective host for them. Like it's gonna, be species dependent. Um, so some effective fish hosts included pirate perches, um, slimy sculpins, a lot of different kinds of darter species. So like Johnny darters, tessellated darters, um, chainback darters, and then also striped bass. So those were considered to be um, effective hosts for this for the glochidia of this particular species of mussel. Now their historical distribution ranged from North Carolina to New Brunswick, Canada. Um, but their population in Canada is considered to be extirpated, so they're no longer found in Canada. And their remaining populations occur in these isolated locations um, between New Hampshire and North Carolina. So I'll go ahead and kind of show, um, this is like an estimate of a current range map. Um, so as you can see, even though it has like, if you say they're, you know, like their range is somewhat large, um, but it has this really disjunct populations. Um, so their status was listed as state endangered in 1977 due to those dwindling populations and increasing rarity. Um, and then in 1990, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed the dwarf wedge mussel as a federally endangered species. Once again, their threats are primarily going to be from pollution from anthropogenic sources. Um, dams, like I said, both man-made and those created by beavers can have negative impacts on bivalve mussels like the dwarf wedge mussels. So just to go into a little more detail about that, the dams can lead to altered habitat. It's going to affect the flow regime. It's going to also isolate them from, or has the potential to isolate them from the fish species that they rely on um, for reproduction. So dams can really kind of um, have a big impact on like isolating species from one another that actually rely on one another. Um, and then also it can lead to decreased dissolved oxygen levels um, and then like also increased variability. So like just more variability in um, the quantity and quality of, of potential food um, for mussels. So in North Carolina, the dwarf wedge mussel is restricted to the Noose and Tar Pimlico River basins. Um, in total, it has been like over time, Overall, it has been found within 18 watersheds in North Carolina, and it has been recorded in the Eno River, but within the last about 15 years, it was only found, or it's only been found in one of eight of the watersheds previously recorded within the Noose River Basin. Um, and that did not actually include the Eno watershed. Um, according to the North, this is a quote from the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, um, the Noose River Basin population of dwarf wedge mussel is highly fragmented, extremely small, and at risk of extirpation. 
Um, however, the uh, Wildlife Resources Commission does have a conservation plan for this species, which includes plans to use captive propagation and or translocation in order to, there's a quote here, <clears throat> Um, in order to augment or establish subpopulations of dwarf wedge mussel where appropriate ha habitat exists. And that does, according to their conservation plan, include the Eno. Um, and then their populations also continue to be monitored every two to five years. So um, this species was for some time known to be the rarest of the Eno mussel species. Um, but in addition to hopefully eventually reintroducing the dwarf wedge mussel to the Eno, um, of course, it's not known, they haven't surveyed every site within the Eno um, for the dwarf wedge mussel, so it's not impossible that it is still living within the river, but um, based on research efforts um, at multiple different sites, uh, it doesn't look great. <laughs> so um, anyway, there are definitely other mussel species within the Eno that we need to be sure to protect. You know, um, this one was in the 60s um, and I, I believe in the 70s, maybe 80s was present in the Eno, um, as well as maybe for some years following those, but, and the populations were relatively stable um, and that has not been the case in more recent years, likely due to urban development around the noose, um, land use changes and all of that. So um, just something to, I thought this was a good example of a species to really um, you know, just be aware of as an example, um, like I said, freshwater mussels are so very important and integral to our river ecosystems. Um, although they are not cute and, or cute or whatever, maybe not the coolest organism, um, to some people, they are so very important and something that we really need to, you know, be aware of and, and, um, and pass on that kind of knowledge and information about them. So, and some of the examples of some of the other mussels uh, are like Atlantic pig toe, green floater. There are some other cool mussel species that live in and around the Eno. So I encourage you to, and those two, a lot of them are facing population decline. So um, I encourage you to do more research on those if you are so inclined. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to the Carolina mad tom, um, the fish species. And then I'll have a little time for if anybody has any questions. Um, and then, like I said, we'll move on to Eric's talk about nutrient water dogs. Um, Carolina Mata. So these these guys are are pretty cool. I like learning and talking about Carolina Matoms. Um, this is a small catfish that is endemic to the Noose and Tar Pimlico River basins in North Carolina. So they've only ever been found in North Carolina. Um, different from the wedge mussel. Um, that I said in North Tar Pimlico River basins, but they're also found in like some other, like New Hampshire, some other places. These guys are only found in North Carolina. Um, and catfishes in this genus, uh, Notorious, are referred to as mad toms, and they can easily be distinguished from other catfish by their adipose fin. This is their adipose fin. Can you guys see the pointer moving? Okay. Um, and it's, it's more, it's fused along its entire length to, uh, its body. So not all fish have adipose fins, but catfish do. And these guys are like fused and are kind of go all the way up here and stay fused. Whereas that's not the case with some other, um, catfish species, just if you were curious. And then the Carolina mad, mad toms also have venomous ducts inside the spines of their pectoral fins. Um, that they can sting with. And it's comparable to the sting of like a, a bee, like a bee sting. Um, so nothing like too crazy, but it wouldn't be fun to be stung by one. Um, <clears throat> so they, Carolina matons, tend to inhabit medium to large sized streams with moderate flow and sand, gravel, cobble, and detritus substrates. Uh, they, one cool thing that we just were talking about is that they will use mus muscle shells as cover you can see this guy like hiding. So they they definitely use um, muscle shells and other things, rocks, other other stuff as as cover. Um, the adults and the young are nocturnal benthic insectivores um, that feed mostly on immature aquatic insects. 
Um, just as a note about their reproduction, it occurs between uh, about mid-May to July um, and their nesting does occur within or under cover objects. So super important that they have those um, kind of objects to use. Uh, so the Carolina Mad Tom's historical range included all major and many minor tributaries to the Noose and Tarpon Lake River basins. Biologists with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission have surveyed for Carolina Mad Tom's in the 60s, the 80s, and then again in 2007. I believe they did a survey a little bit later that I didn't have, I couldn't find a whole lot of information on, but I believe it's pretty um, like similar to the information that was found in 2007. So I'll just go over that really quick. So in the 60s, the populations appear to be healthy. By the 80s, biologists were noticing these steady declines. Um, and then in 2007, the Wildlife Resources Commission found that this species was only at 10% of the areas where the fish historically occurred within the Noose River Basin. So only two populations were found. Now, on the other hand, the Tar River populations um, were doing a lot better. So 90% of the sampled sites that historically had Carolina Mad Toms still had healthy populations in the Tar River. Um, and that difference is likely due to the land use around those, the differing land use practices around um, those two river basins. So um, there's been a lot more development, uh, urban development in and around the Noose River um, with growth and deforestation near streams. Uh, leading to degraded water quality and freshwater habitat, whereas um, the Tar River Basin is mostly, still has mostly um, rural communities, uh, forests, farmlands, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so in 2007, the Carolina Mad Tom was listed as threatened in a federal species of concern. It was announced in June of last year, um, I think it was June, that the Carolina Mad Tom would be listed at, under the, as endangered under the Endangered Species Act by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service designated 257 river miles and seven management units in North Carolina as critical habitat for the Carolina Mad Tom, and the Eno River was one of those. Although it was not occupied, by Carolina, the Eno was not occupied by Carolina Mad Toms at the time of the listing. It is considered by the Fish and Wildlife Service to still be, and this is a quote, essential to the conservation of the species. This is a little current range map. Um, and then I'll just go to this kind of quote from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. <clears throat> um, so currently the Fish and Wildlife Service is working in partnership with other entities uh, to continue research efforts to develop a captive breeding program to minimize impacts from bridge and culvert construction to engage. This is an important part of it is engaging private landowners through the safe harbor agreement um, and trying to get them on board with protecting their land. Um, and also they are targeting parcels for acquisition and key watersheds. So there's a lot going on there with, that comes with the endangered, um, you know, brings along with it this kind of multi-tiered conservation plan to hopefully protect current populations of the Carolina Mad Tom while also potentially augmenting with subpopulations and other rivers like the Eno that have been deemed to have the biological and physical characteristics necessary for this um, species to, to survive and thrive. Um, <clears throat> so in addition to the government agencies and organizations who are working on conservation plan for species like the dwarf watch mussel, the Carolina mad tom, there are things that I know, you know, it it's, can be discouraging to hear all of, all of these things, um, but when it comes to things that like we can potentially do to help. Um, a lot of it does happen at a policy level. Um, but one thing that you can do at an individual level is just one like avoiding altering habitat. So I think at Fuse Ford, they have signs that kind of implore visitors to refrain from moving rocks around in the river, stacking rocks, taking them out of the river, anything like that. I know it sounds, you know, innocuous, but aquatic organisms use those rocks for their survival, right? They're, they're used for shelter, they're used in reproduction by fish, by insects, by amphibians. Um, and, you know, it, 
ideally we we leave things as they are right because even though we may not be able to see it or notice it um those rocks and those muscle shells whatever it may be are actually part of an ecosystem um also an algae that grows on rocks can serve as food for some species and also helps to clean the water so like taking rocks out of the river is also not ideal um also just respecting our rivers, right? Our river systems, our land, pick up after yourself, collecting litter when you encounter it, you know, and you're even in, you know, as, as we know, we live in a watershed, so things drain when it rains, things that we put on the ground um, are going to drain into our rivers and streams. So, you know, using pesticides, herbicides as directed, um, disposing of hazardous materials properly, all of those things, are important on a on a day to day basis, and then also just getting involved with advocacy and and um, you know being aware of potential developments in the area and advocate advocating you know for the protection of riparian forests as well as for water quality regulation and things like that um, is going to be really really important in the future as as we continue you know as Durham continues to grow um, Black Meadow Ridge is is a good example of that which I'm sure most of you have probably heard of um, as a potential land development that could really negatively impact the Eno River's water quality, as well as cause other issues like flooding. Um, and then also just voting for people who prioritize environmental in issues. Um, so that's pretty much it for my kind of spiel. Um, I definitely wanna, does anybody have any questions or anything? I wanna go ahead and make sure Eric has time to, to talk. Oh, thank you, Hillary, for putting that in the chat. Um, I'll give it like, okay, I think we're good. So unless anyone wants to speak up, then we will go ahead and move on to Eric. I don't see anything in the Zoom or the Facebook chat at this moment. Okay. So I will be controlling this guy over here. Oh, I think I forgot to mention that Hillary was here working in the background. So thank you, Hillary. <laughs> she's she's monitoring the chat and all that good stuff. Okay, does this look good to everyone? Yes. Okay, great. Um, like I said, Eric, just give another brief introduction in case someone missed it. Eric Teetsworth is a PhD candidate at NC State University. Um, and he has been there for, he said he's been for eight semesters, he's been um largely out in the field doing um <laughs> surveys on noose river water dogs which is super exciting so um thank you so much for being here eric we're excited to hear from you yeah thank you so much um i'm, I'm happy to be here as well you know, this is a species that's really near and dear to my heart and you know, realistically one of the only things i think about these days and so you know i, I think it's a really charismatic species that we have in our area i'm excited to share a little bit about it So I first want to start out with just what is a noose river water dog? You know, I find in doing my surveys that most people have never heard of this species, even though it occurs in our region. So this is a large aquatic salamander. So meaning one of our amphibians that we have native to the area are brown with black spots. And those spots are unique to each individual sort of like a fingerprint, um, which is sometimes useful when we're thinking about, you know, um, recognizing different individuals. Uh, they have external gills, which are those red sort of feathery looking things on either side of their head, which they use to help them breathe. Uh, they also breathe through their skin uh, quite a bit as well, which is a, another trait of amphibians. Um, they have a flattened paddle-like tail, um, so not flat like a beaver, but maybe flat like a fish um, to help them propel themselves through the water. They're actually quite a large animal, so the average size of an adult that we tend to see is about seven and a half inches, um, and so pretty large, probably larger than most salamanders that you tend to see um, if you're turning over rocks or logs or something up on land. Um, and the largest that they could get is maybe even in excess of a foot. Um, the largest one I've personally seen is about 10 and a half inches, um, but I have heard actually recent verified records of some that are about 11 and three quarters. Um, so quite, quite large um, for something that you're not expecting to find. 
And I wanted to mention uh, that they are what we might term as pedomorphic, which is kind of a large word, but what that really means is that they have the characteristics of juveniles. Um, and so if you've ever spent some time in a stream or a river and you've seen you know, these really small salamanders, they probably look very similar to what these images show here for a water dog. Um, a lot of salamanders have a aquatic stage of their life before they move on to land where you know the juveniles or the, the fresh young um, have this uh, have all of these traits with the flattened tail and the gills. Um, the only difference with the water dog is they retain these through their entire lifetime, um, which is something that they've evolved, um, which is maybe a little bit different than a lot of salamanders. And so to think a little bit about the life history of these animals, we are currently on the tail end of their breeding season, which occurs in the winter months of January through March. Um, following breeding, females will then lay eggs anywhere from May to June, and they'll lay these eggs in clusters of up to 30, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. Um, and adhere them kind of as is shown in the picture at the very top of this figure. Uh, they'll adhere these eggs in a cluster to the underside of a rock or a log or some other sort of structure. So again, coming back to this theme that cover in the stream is really important for them to complete some of their life cycle. Once these eggs hatch in uh, the end of June, beginning of July timeframe, um, you'll get these very small, uh, babies, which we usually refer to as larvae. Um, those larvae, or even juveniles is a fine word, um, will take about five to seven years to mature, so actually quite a long time. And once they mature, we actually don't know how long they could live, but uh, we are fairly certain it's at least 15 years. Um, it could be 20 years, could be 30 years. Um, we're, we're not actually sure. We haven't you know, had any verified documents, but we do know that it takes them quite a long time to mature. And we know that they grow very, very slowly. And so if you see one of these animals that's almost a foot long, you might be looking at something that's as old or older than yourself, um, which is kind of impressive. Now, where do these fit within the food web, sort of the ecosystem of the rivers? Um, they are a um, sort of mid-level predator, eating things like fly larvae, or small snails, or potentially even crayfish, depending on how big they are. And this might seem like a wide variety of foods that they eat, and that's true. They, they are sort of uh, generalists in that way, where if it's small enough to fit in their mouth, they're probably going to try to eat it. Um, there's even been some very rare documentations of eating small snakes that have been unfortunate enough to fall into the water. Um, they do all of this feeding and the majority of their movement at night, um, presumably when it's a little bit safer for them to leave their cover and be out and about when most fish are a little bit less active. Um, although that activity is pretty limited, they're typically more of ambush predators edge of some cover uh, and wait for something to come by. And when, you know, some little like, creature that looks appetizing to them floats by or walks by, um, they use what's called suction feeding. So it's something that most fish use as well, where they'll open their mouth so quickly that actually creates a back like vacuum pressure, like sucking the animal into their mouth. Um, so again, just kind of helping them to move as little as possible with still being able to feed. Now, they are preyed on by some larger aquatic predators that you might be familiar with. Um, now, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we have, as far as I'm aware, no confirmed records of other animals eating water dogs. Until recently, actually just two days ago, uh, someone posted on a Facebook page that they found some water dogs in a bunch of really large catfish. So uh, it was confirmed catfish do definitely eat these, uh, but based on what we know of other related salamanders, probably water snakes, 
herons, you know, these, these big predators that you would associate with, uh, ri with riverways um, probably prey on these as well. So where is the Noose River water dog found? Um, you'll see a trend here that a lot of species are endemic, meaning only found in the Noose and Tar Pamlico River basins. The Carolina Mad Tom being a good example of one. Um, there are multiple mussel species, a crayfish species, lots of things that are only found in the Noose and Tar, uh, which ecologically are sort of two sister uh, systems within North Carolina. Um, and so it's really exciting that this is another part of that um, community that's only found in our region. And I have that arrow pointing to roughly where the Noose River is, or sorry, roughly where the Eno River is within the Noose River Basin uh, to give you some context. Now, within these systems, they're found in both the Piedmont and Coastal Plain ecoregions. So Piedmont being where the Eno River is, which is sort of this cobble, gravel, even you know, bedrock, depending on the area. Um, but they're found all the way out near the coast as well, which are really more of these sort of slower, uh, lower gradient sandy streams. And that sounds like a pretty wide variety of habitat types between those two places, and it is. Um, but what they really require are these larger, so fourth order and larger. Uh, the Eno River is a sixth order stream for reference. Um, these larger streams that are permanently flowing uh, have well oxygenated water and plenty of in-stream structure, whether that's rocks or logs to hide in. So just a little bit of history on um, where water dogs are found. Uh, there has been very, very little research on this species, which is some of the reason why I'm studying it. Um, but so to start, the first uh, research that I've been able to determine, um, you know, that's aside from just describing it, was actually conducted by a Duke University graduate student uh, within the mid 1960s, where he went out and found a bunch of individuals. Actually, most of his study sites were in the Eno River, um, just trying to look at, you know, what sorts of habitats did they prefer. Then in the late 70s, so 1978 to 1981, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science actually expanded that and surveyed the entirety of the Noose Antar Basin just to determine where is this species found, what uh, does its diet look like, um, you know, what, what, like anything that we know about the water dog basically comes from this study. And that's in the map that I've included here. Um, those were their findings. And they found healthy populations in a lot of places. But as you could see here in some of the circled um, outlines, um, these are some of the places where we're actually seeing declines. Um, so following those surveys around 1980, there's a 30 year gap in virtually any survey effort so the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission decided to go and resurvey some of those historic places. And they found declines throughout the new Centaur, but predominantly in the new basin uh, around the triangle. So Raleigh, Durham, you know, the Eno River, the Noose River in Wake County um, is, is where we're seeing a lot of the declines, unfortunately. And this is maybe not surprising because, now I'm sorry, there's a lot of color here, um, but I included here a map of just general and another map from 2016. And really where you wanna be looking is on the left side of both of these um, maps. And you can see that red area, which represents developed land cover. Um, and so, that, I mean, that especially around the triangle has expanded greatly. Um, and so I've highlighted a couple of the key um, numbers down here. Um, if you wanna, yep. So developed land cover has um, exploded in both of these river basins uh, within the last 40 years. In the Noose River, forested land cover has declined fairly substantially. And I also wanted to highlight open water land cover. Um, now, obviously, these numbers are extremely high, 
but that's because naturally these systems don't have a lot of natural ponds or lakes. So these original surveys done by the museum that I referenced before were actually done pre-Falls Lake. Um, and so you can imagine if this is a species that needs permanent flowing water, having all of these recent impoundments, um, while beneficial to us, is not necessarily beneficial to the water dog, both because it alters habitat and because it fragments um, populations. So uh, as Audrey alluded to before, um, this New River water dog was actually just recently listed along with the Carolina Mad Tom uh, at the same time in June of last year um, under the Endangered Species Act. But whereas the Mad Tom was listed as endangered, the New River water dog was listed as threatened. Um, thankfully, it seems to be at least persisting a little bit better. It's a little bit more tolerant to some of these disturbances than the catfish is. With that, there has been um, 1,200 kilometers, or if you have that, that's essentially the, the amount of stream miles um, of critical habitat has been designated. Um, so the Eno River being one of these places, which almost the entirety of it is critical habitat for the new server water dog. Um, and during this listing process, the Fish and Wildlife Service hypothesized that some of the primary threats to water dog survival are things like natural system modification, so meaning development, changes to hydrology by you know, dam creation, uh, pollution, invasive species, agricultural and forestry, and energy and mining. Uh, so basically a wide swath of just anything that could potentially negatively impact our waterways. And so this is around when I came in. I actually started in 2018. So when we knew that there was a problem uh, that needed to be solved in terms of the species declining, but just before the official federal listing had taken place. And we came in to determine its extant distribution, so meaning where is it still found. We wanted to identify the primary threats to its persistence. So why is it declining? We wanted to identify where reproducing populations still are, because since this is a long-lived species, it might not be that informative if you catch adults. We really want to see where the juveniles are. And lastly, we want to figure out um, a little bit more about our monitoring methodology. Now, this is an animal that you know, is <laughs> vaguely mud-colored and spends its time in large bodies of water. And so for clear reasons, it's very difficult to find. And if we understand some of what influences uh, how difficult they are to find, that might help us in um, better researching their populations. So what I've done in terms for my research is I've done my own surveys. So going out and trying to find these things wherever I can. And so I've conducted my surveys during the winter survey season. So again, when they're more active, when they're breeding, this is the time of year when water dogs are actually available to be captured using the method that I've pictured here with a minnow trap. Now, during the summer, you actually can't catch them in the same way. So you have a very small window of opportunity to do this research. Over the last four years, I've visited now 163 locations, most of them multiple times. And in these, I've found water dogs at 75 of those locations. And at those 75 spots, we've caught 550 total new server water dogs, which is actually pretty amazing. Um, and we're really starting to get a, a good sense of where they are and where they're not. Now, within, in the Eno River specifically, it's a little bit of a different story. We've made eight locations, and only three of those have been places where I've actually found water dogs. And at those three spots, I've only caught five adults total in those four years. Um, so those are in the vicinity of West Point and Penny's Bend, and then a little bit east of Hillsboro as well. Um, and none were found at some of the historic places like Fuse Ford or the Coal Mill Road access, 
Um, all of these were places where back during that original Duke students surveys in the 1960s, they were abundant everywhere. Um, and so it's a little bit um, uh, of an alarm bell, so to speak, to have surveyed all of these places fairly extensively and only caught five adults. However, they're faring a little bit better than the Dwarf Wedge Mussel or the Carolina Mad Tom. They are still confirmed at some of these locations, which is important to note. And so what have I learned so far during my research? Well, I've used some occupancy models to indicate that sedimentation might be a primary stressor. This is because uh, within our models, we're seeing that the type of substrate, so whether it's rocks or whether it's sand or silt, um, is helping us predict where water dogs are. Additionally, uh, land cover types that we would associate with high disturbance, uh, like developed land cover, or especially pasture land cover, where you have livestock trudging around through the streams, um, seem to also be correlated with where we are not finding water dogs. Um, so we did not find any relationships with things like, you know, pollution um, of different, you know, but that's not to say that pollution isn't a problem. I mean, that's probably a small piece of the pie, but I think it's really these alterations to habitat and the general flow of water, the hydrology in our systems. Now, we do know that adult water dogs can still be found in some of these areas that seem less desirable as habitat where erosion and sedimentation are big problems. Uh, a great example of this was back in March of last year, a consultant actually found an adult in Crabtree Creek um, in the vicinity of Capitol Boulevard in, in downtown Raleigh, which is the only individual found in that system in about the last 40 years and probably doesn't represent a healthy population, but does go to show that adults can be a little bit more resilient to some of these stressors. But because of the research that's been done with some similar species like hellbenders in the mountains, or other types of large salamanders in other parts of the country, we think that sedimentation probably decreases the nesting sites and the hiding places for this species. So as there's a lot of erosion and uh, you know, the banks sort of wear away, all of that material fills in the little nooks and crannies among the rocks where water dogs need to lay their eggs. And so we're wondering um, if you, uh, you know, we have this new hypothesis now, um, if you click on the, if you go ahead, Audrey. Um, so we have this new hypothesis that we think the declines in occurrence that we're seeing are a lack of reproduction, um, primarily because of this sedimentation um, and even just increased flooding. Um, you know, that's another thing we don't necessarily think about, but the Eno River floods pretty frequently, as does a lot of these systems in the New Centaur. And historically, they flood a lot more frequently now than they used to. Um, and so it could be, you know, a mix of filling in those nooks and crannies, or it could also be just having these frequent high flooding events just disturbs the habitat enough um, that it's limiting the water dog's ability to reproduce. And so how do we go about recovering water dog populations? So um, it, it seems easy as a bullet point, decrease flooding and sedimentation through bank and buffer stabilization. But let me tell you, those are not easy things, you know, especially in an area like where we live now um, that have high demands of you know, urban expansion and there's constantly development going on. It's really difficult to protect um, the banks and buffers in our area. And it's even more difficult to reverse the damage that's already been done. Um, so at least the first step that we need to take is you know, preserving what we do have available and preventing it from getting worse. Um, we also really should <laughs> spend a lot more time decreasing pollution. Um, while I said adults don't seem very susceptible to um, slight swings in water quality, um, it probably uh, threatens the prey that water dogs eat. So, you know, we, we know 
that a lot of these small insects and macroinvertebrates that are in the water uh, that the water dogs need to eat and survive on, those are more sensitive to water quality. Um, additionally, even though we don't think water quality impacts adults, we have no idea what its effect is on juveniles. So I, I think that it's the sedimentation and inability to nest that is the problem, but it could also be that water quality um, you know, really impacts maybe egg survival, for instance. And, and that's something that we need to look into. Um, additionally, like I've kind of keep going back to, is we need to get better at monitoring juvenile abundances. And that's so that we can guarantee local population resilience. Um, you know, if you can imagine you have this really long lived animal, doesn't necessarily matter that you're seeing adults because that could be a 30 year old creature that hasn't bred in 10 years. Um, and it's really difficult to assess that there's a problem unless you're actually seeing uh, these young animals at a more frequent um, occurrence. And so what do I wanna do you know, moving into the future? So you know, of course I've already put four years into this, but it's really been data collection. Now I need to actually, sit in front of the computer and analyze all this data. What I wanna figure out is I want to explore the impact of increased flooding in these systems since that 1980 study. So taking some of their data from back then, taking my data from now and looking at how the landscape and hydrology patterns have changed. I also really want to determine where habitat or what habitat is important for young water dogs. Again, because I think that's really crucial to understanding the health and stability of these populations. And then finally, we're going to be applying all of our findings towards guiding the management decisions for the species and ultimately the Fish and Wildlife Service recovery plan. So with each federally listed species, the Fish and Wildlife Service is required to write a formal recovery plan stating what they plan to do to improve the um, health and stability of that animal. And so this research is going to be crucial towards informing some of those decisions and plans. So you might be asking yourself how you can help. Um, the easiest thing to do is advocate for stream uh, buffer preservation. Um, so advocating for uh, entities like the Eno River Association, which this is their one of their missions, one of their more, most important missions is just trying to preserve land around the Eno River so that these impacts of erosion and sedimentation are limited and don't get worse. Um, you know, that's going to be really, really important. Like I mentioned, because it's hard to reverse those things. So getting it on the front end is really what we need to focus on. We also need to advocate for improvements to water quality regulation. You know, we have lots of rules and regulations on you know, what needs to be done with, uh, with wastewater and um, you know, hazardous materials. And I, you know, I'm not the only one who's probably noticed uh, violations of this, especially um, you know, like violations of like, silt fencing not working properly during development and, and things like that. Uh, so just you know, really advocating for uh, just better regulation of these systems that theoretically should work. And then finally, we, are, we would love to have any information that anyone might have on seeing a new server water dog. Now, as I mentioned before, these are incredibly difficult to find if you're not looking for them, but on rare occasion, people do stumble across them and they don't know that this is a really special animal that, um, and that occurrence information is useful to both myself and the Wildlife Resources Commission. And so I included a link down here at public inquiry uh, hyphen fishwildlife at ncwildlife.org. Um, is who you would reach out to with, um, you know, like a photo and occurrence data, um, just to keep our records up to date. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. Hopefully I didn't run, oh no, good, I didn't run through that too quickly, but uh, we'll have some time to talk a little bit more if you have any questions. And I included my email down here. Um, if you happen to have any more questions that you don't want to answer or ask right now, Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. That was a really very insightful and helpful. I mean, I've read about the Deuce River Water Dog, but it's a little bit different um, hearing someone who's out there, you know, getting their their shoes dirty looking for them. So um anyway yeah, they're, they're an amazing creature so unfor it's unfortunate that not everyone can get to experience them because they are yeah they're they're pretty amazing yeah i have never seen one so like in person so um that is just really cool uh okay let's see we have a question from margaret schubert um it says what role do dams like at west point and lake ben johnson have on these species short of taking these down what can we do to make them less of a barrier yeah i, I can i can try to start off on that one dams are so complicated especially in this part of the state um so historically we think of them as being problematic for limiting how species move on the landscape. Uh, so, you know, fragmenting a population and the ability to disperse their genes sort of over the landscape is maybe how we think about it. Um, like that's that's a big problem. Um, and yeah, population connectivity is something that we really need to consider. Now, in our area, <laughs> we have a sort of a mixed relationship with dams because they help, they actually help to preserve some of the habitat immediately downstream of the dam. So upstream of the dam, it's altering habitat in negative ways and downstream of the dam, it's actually preserving this habitat that you actually want to keep, which in our system is somewhat of a good thing because we have so many changes to the hydrology that it would potentially get bad everywhere. Uh, if that dam wasn't there sort of mitigating some of those um, you know, flashy flooding conditions. Uh, so, and so it's, it's sort of a, you know, what are you prioritizing? And does that justify removing the dam or keeping it? Um, yeah, absolutely. I know that there's like, <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the water dog biting question. I know that there's like legacy sediment associated with dams and all sorts of mm -hmm. um, things that, like Eric was saying, I think it's a, a complicated question and concept that I certainly don't have the answer to, but I would just say uh, really it's a large part of it is keeping your ear to the ground about new dam construction as well and being aware of that and advocating, um, you know, cause, cause like Eric was saying, r removing a dam is gonna be complicated for, for many reasons and mm -hmm. might not necessarily, it's not just gonna like be waving a magic wand to, to fix the issues that it's created. So uh, mm -hmm. in my mind, it has more to do with, um, stopping future dams from being constructed and maybe that's not a super helpful answer um but um that's kind of what what came to my mind but that's a great yeah question. It, it's Mark. it's challenging even for people who know far more about dams and hydrology than we do yeah i was gonna say i'm not i'm certainly no um i know the basics about dams um but yeah mm -hmm. not not a hydrologist necessarily mm -hmm. but Okay, uh, um, so Eric, does, does, yeah. the, does the water dog bite? I love this question. It's a super fair one. Um, thankfully, I can say, well, first I'll say uh, sort of what you teach any kid is anything with teeth can bite. Um, and so theoretically, yes, they can. But I can say uh, happily that I've handled about 400, 450 of these myself, and I've never been bitten by one. Uh, most salamanders um, tend to not be interested <laughs> in biting. I think it's just something they sort of recognize as uh, a moot point. Um, so theoretically, yes, but no, they, they don't really bite. Mm -hmm. Well, they probably have, a, like, are, are their mouths, how small are their mouths? Uh, like they're, relati they're relatively small. 
Um, I guess I mean, they I've, are. If they can get up to a foot long, then it, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I've. I've yeah. Um, okay, and then let's see. We had someone ask about the Black Meadow Ridge development. Okay, and Jessica responded and said the Black Meadow Ridge site plan has been approved, but the development construction is on hold until a late May Board of Adjustment hearing, wherein we'll be fighting against the zoning designation. Yeah, so it's a work in progress is the answer to that one. Um, and it, it's one of those lengthy kind of processes mm -hmm. that we have to, you know, keep working toward. Yeah, um, and I guess, you, you know, the, kind of the initial, say, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, thank you for answering the question out loud because our Facebook folks can't see the questions when they come through. Oh, so I okay. do appreciate repeating the question and, and saying the answer. So thank you very much for doing that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> and I guess that, that uh, answer was prompted by, you know, it, it sounds like this will be detrimental for the water dog, um, the, the development of that Black Meadow Ridge, um, you know, proposed housing development. Um, and I would say, yeah, probably. I mean, at, at this point, uh, the way that the Eno River system has been impacted by development, we're at a stage now where um, there's already too much impact. And so kind of just the addition is just making it more and more difficult for us to make sure that these sensitive species remain on the landscape. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Does anybody have any lingering questions? Like I said, this will be recorded. So if you came in, or it is has been recorded, if you came in late, um, then you can always go on Facebook. I, I think it'll be on our Facebook page and then it'll maybe a little bit later, we'll add it to our YouTube channel as well. Um, oh, and Hillary just shared a link um, to, the, to the YouTube uh, channel. So um, if, if you want to go back and, and rewatch it or anything like that, uh, feel free to, um, Eric provided his email. Um, you can find me at the Inner River Association on the Inner River Association website with my email. Um, but thank you guys so, so much for coming and thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Um, that was so like, just cool to hear about your research and so helpful. So, um, we will be back next month and we will be talking about um, climate change and how climate change impacts rivers, maybe a little bit about climate change communication. Um, so that's going to be the theme of next month, the last Friday of the month, I believe, but we'll have those dates um, on, on our socials and all of that. So just keep an eye out and an ear out. But thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. And thank you, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. I'll stick on a minute if you need me. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay on for a minute.